Everyone, um, thank you for joining us here today. Um, I want to say, wow, we've really gotten off to a terrific start and we really appreciated the remarks um, by Secretary Vilsack challenging us to be bold and innovative. Um, so I wanna thank you, um, especially all the people who've joined us here today for um, today's conversation and to our panelists who have taken the time to join us. You know, today one in four kids are facing hunger as a result of this pandemic. And the numbers could have been much worse if it weren't for school meals, pandemic EBT, SNAP and WIC that have played a vital role in alleviating food insecurity. Um, our federal nutrition programs are often our first line of defense against hunger. And as we continue to fight the pandemic and take steps to rebuild our communities and economy, we must ensure that policies we implement are designed to address the geographic, cultural and racial inequities that have left too many behind. We know that the consequences of not providing consistent access to nutritious food will impede our children's health, development, and educational outcomes. These consequences can last a lifetime if not addressed now. In the last year, we have seen how public and community partnerships have played a critical role in meeting the needs of rural children across the country. The flexibilities provided by USDA Nutrition um, waivers and the COVID relief funding from the most recent package, um, the American Rescue Plan, are providing the resources that are critical to ensuring that families and children in, in rural communities are getting the food assistance they need to weather this national health crisis. Today, we will hear from three panelists who have been on the front line helping rural communities and communities across the country to talk about what they have learned the challenges, and yes, even the silver linings. And as Secretary Vilsack said this morning in his remarks, we have an opportunity for bold change, transformational change. And today we will examine some of those opportunities through our, through our conversation, how we can capture innovations that were realized through this pandemic to provide more access for children who need nutritious food. So please settle in um, as we get this conversation started. And I will start by introducing um, all of our panelists who are truly amazing people. And I know that you will enjoy hearing from them today. So today I would like to start with Stacy Dean, who is the Deputy Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition and Consumer Services, United States Department of Agriculture. Stacey Dean was appointed by President Biden to serve, the to serve as the Deputy Undersecretary for USDA's Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services, where she will work to advance the President's agenda on increasing nutrition assistance. But for those of us in the advocacy community, we know Stacey best um, as she worked to direct the Center for Best, um, the Center's Budget and Policy Priorities um, Food Assistance Team. Also, we have with us Cheryl Johnson, who is the Director of Child Nutrition and Wellness for the Kansas State Department of Education. Cheryl is Director of Child Nutrition and Wellness for Kansas State Department of Education, um, where her team has worked relentlessly in helping to provide meals to children all across Kansas. And then finally, I would like to introduce Emily Chatelaine, um, who is the Executive Director of the Three O'Clock Project. Emily has so many years providing operations and financial and human resource management to schools all across the country. Um, through all of her work and working with schools and managing the National School Lunch Program, in 2017, Emily saw the need for more robust after-school meal programs. She started her nonprofit, The Three O'Clock Project, and began providing healthy meals to after-school and summer programs through the CACFP and CFCSP federal child nutrition programs. So I'm sure if we could all hear um, all of you, we would um, see that we would give them a great round of applause. So thank you for joining us here today. And so Stacy, if you could get us started and just provide us a little overview of the work that you're doing, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Monica, and, you know, um, for your warm introduction and 
for your friendship over the years. And uh, I feel like we have been comrades in arms for a long time, um, both for you personally and of course, Share Our Strength, an amazing organization. And all of the folks who are here and listening and participating just, uh, uh, it, it is virtual, but uh, to be with a group that has done so many amazing things to tackle child hunger is just wonderful. So thank you for having me. Um, look, the past year has presented some extraordinary challenges but beyond what we would have ever previously imagined as uh, schools closed uh, with no notice um, and they, they were forced to completely revise service models, same with SNAP offices. Uh, both of which are, you know, operating programs and SNAP and school meals that have a lot of rigidity to them and aren't uh, aren't traditionally open to different, wildly different operational approaches. And the creativity and dedication that schools showed in ensuring that children and families maintain access to nutrition is inspiring, um, as is the work that SNAP agencies did to, to help uh, connect folks to benefits. Um, and I really want to you to know, and you heard from the secretary this morning, so it's, he's a tough act to follow, that both USDA and the Biden administration really share your deep commitment to service and ensuring that the most vulnerable among us are provided for. We, um, it, it is, it, it's a big part of what I'm just, I'm going to be talking about. We're also really keen to learn what's worked during this past year and where we have models for program improvement that we want to bring forward. So you had the opportunity to hear from Secretary Vilsack about things USDA is doing to address the pandemic. I just want to talk a little bit, a uh, little bit more about some of what we've learned and provide a few more details about actions the administration is taking and will continue to take. And of course, we'll do a lot through Q and A. And more fundamentally, I really want to hear from you whether it's this forum uh, or uh, connecting up through our office, uh, to you directly or through organizations like Share Our Strength. We need to hear from you. You're on the front lines. You understand the unique needs of your communities. And we really value your perspectives and find it so critical as we, um, as we craft policy and think about uh, where we need to take the, most, the next steps. So um, it's been said by others, but it really bears repeating that the COVID-19 public health and economic crisis has been bigger than anything we've ever seen in our lifetimes, leaving millions of families struggling to afford food and keep a roof over their head. Um, with so many businesses still closed in an effort to prevent the virus, people out of work, they're just struggling to cover basic expenses. Parents are wondering how they're going to feed their kids, um, not able to pay their bills. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, many families are falling behind on rent, uh, facing homelessness. So a key fundamental learning from this past year uh, before we get to the lessons learned of the response, it's just how fragile so many families' economic situation is. The crisis of food insecurity still today, even with the response of so many, remains so urgent with some 25 million adults and as many 6 to 10 million children in households struggling to afford food. Um, it's a painful picture, and even more so for communities of color, where the crisis of food insecurity has had a disproportionate impact. Black and Latino adults have been almost twice as likely as white adults to report that their households don't have enough to eat. Similar rates of disparity exist for adults who identify as uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, who for data reasons as have to be grouped together because the sample sizes are smaller. And at USDA, we've also learned and continue are very concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on rural communities, where historically the depth and severity of poverty has been much greater, especially in historically uh, poor areas of the South Southeast, including the Mississippi Delta and Appalachia, as well as on Native American lands. And sadly, but unsurprisingly, racial disparities are still present in those hard hit rural communities with um, rates of poverty amongst African Americans, Native Americans and Hispanics, um, twice as that of uh, white Americans in rural areas. So because of that, President Biden has clearly made beating the pandemic and restoring the economy and providing relief for all Americans his top priority. And really under his leadership, we, 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 are, we are all go firing on all cylinders to strengthen our programs, remove barriers to access and ensure that children and families have access to safe and healthy food. So and that really was what the American Rescue Plan was and is about the, uh, the need to tackle this, uh, uh, this core fragility that uh, exposed so many people to such incredible hardship. 
So, but with this new legislation, we, um, we have some new tools to shore up our efforts and all the work that you've been doing to support struggling families. So I'm just gonna tick through some of the, um, the top line provisions and then spend a second on nutrition and because I know Monica needs me to move it along. Um, so look, the, when you think back or when you think about the American Rescue Plan, the nutrition provisions are critical and I'm championing them, but uh, this is a bill that will put um, a million, lift millions of Americans out of poverty, reduce hunger, help underserved and marginalized communities who are getting hardest hit by the pandemic because of its breadth and all of the things it does. Cash assistance to Americans in need with $1,400 checks, financial resources for schools to open, reopen safely, child and worker tax credits that are expected to cut child poverty in half and bringing billions of dollars into rural communities across the country to support housing assistance um, and infrastructure development, including hospitals, broadband, uh, and vaccine uh, distribution. That's to meet immediate needs and also to help with the uh, economic recovery. And in the arena of food assistance, uh, it extends the temporary bump and SNAP benefits for all participants through September 30th. Since January, SNAP's been issuing an extra $28 per person per month in benefits to participating households, so more than an extra $100 a month for a family of four. This was set to expire in June. It'll now continue through the summer till the end of September. It provides a billion dollars in administrative state support for states to um, respond to increased need, as well as make critical investments to increase access, which I hope we talk about. Uh, money for us to work with retailers to uh, improve online shopping, um, purchasing food uh, through online vehicles, uh, and more than $900 million to strengthen WIC, including nearly $500 million uh, for vouchers to make fresh fruits and vegetable um, uh, purchases. And finally, a really cornerstone provision is taking that pandemic PEBT provision um, making it available throughout the duration of the federal public health emergency and uh, at state auction available this summer and next summer. So a sort of de facto summer EBT program for the next two summers, which is something I know has been a critical priority for Share of Strength and other, other partners. There are numerous other nutrition provisions, but I, we can go through those in Q&A. So look, even with all of this support, there's plenty of work to do. Um, we, we've got to list, lift, all, leverage all of our existing authorities uh, and, and work with all of our partners like you all to make sure we're reaching eligible children with all the support we can. So I look forward to talking more and hearing from uh, the great, great uh, other speakers and, and hearing their and your perspective. So with that, Monica, I'll wrap up. Great, Stacy. thank you so much. And I just wanna say how much we have appreciated um, you being so accessible to all of us in your new role and willing to listen to all of our concerns and all of our ideas. So thank you for that. And so next I'd like to ask um, Cheryl from the Kansas City, from the Kansas State um, District of Education. I'm sorry, I really bungled that. Um, so my apologies on that one. Let me try that again from the Kansas State Department of Education. Um, so, you know, we're looking forward to hearing from you just about um, how you've really kind of tackled and provided an overview um, from your perspective of where you sit in Kansas. So thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl, I think you're on mute. <laughs> thank you, Monica. Okay. Um, welcome from Kansas, uh, the Kansas State Department of Education. We administer all the USDA child nutrition programs in Kansas. That includes the National School Lunch Program, School Breakfast Program, Child and Adult Care Food Program, Summer Food Service Program, Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program. We also have team nutrition grants, technology grants, and a Body Venture State Health Initiative. So I'm representing a team of 28 amazing, hardworking, passionate leaders that serve sponsors of child nutrition programs in Kansas. I grew up on a Kansas farm in a rural area. So um, this topic is definitely dear to my heart. And so I just want you all to, we'll start with, you know, in Kansas, when you're driving down a rural road, you have your hands on the steering wheel, everyone is your friend and you always welcome people with the standard Kansas wave, which was just, you just raise your fingers and that's it. 
Um, so, so glad to be here. Thank you, Share Our Strength. And here we go. Where have we been and where do we go now? Thank you for the slide. During the week of March 11th, our team started to get calls that some schools were going to have unanticipated school closures due to the pandemic. And we were learning information about possible waiver opportunities from USDA. Kansas did have a state waiver already approved that allowed school districts to serve meals during unanticipated school closures, which we were so thankful we had written and received approval for in December 29. My first lesson learned is number one, always be proactive in applying for waiver authority. This helped us a great deal. We had done that because we thought there could be um, snow and ice days and some of our rural communities might need the ability to offer meals during extended days out. We had no idea at that point that we would be using that waiver authority due to a pandemic. On March 16th, Governor Kelly was the first governor in the nation to close all schools. She did emphasize that many Kansas children rely on school meals and needed meal options while school was closed. She and the Commissioner of Education encouraged all schools to continue to find ways to provide healthy meals. And they even wanted to know those who made a decision not to serve meals and often reach out to encourage those schools to continue meal service after our team had already reached out and then they were able to give us some additional support in that. So after the governor's order, things really heated up. Um, we helped our sponsors transition from serving traditional school meals to implementing COVID emergency meal service. What we now affectionately call the pivot Sometimes we call that cafeteria to curbside. A lot of times it literally happened overnight due to the amazing planning, the creativity and dedication of Kansas food service directors with the support of the child nutrition and wellness team and getting those waivers and sites approved. If you look at the slide I have here in the uh, very beginning, of course, we only had statewide waivers. And as we were waiting for uh, the nationwide waivers, which we really appreciated when that happened, uh, because then we could stop worrying about writing waivers and can get on with the business of trying to make sure that children received meals. But if you look at program year 2019, um, Normally we have about 400 national school lunch program sponsors, um, no seamless summer because our folks in the summer transition to the summer food service program because you do get more reimbursement. And then for the child and adult care food program, we had 334. Um, during 2020, those numbers were pretty much the same until March when all of a sudden um, we assisted our sponsors to either implement the seamless summer option or the summer food service program. So you can see the numbers of sponsors that we helped. Um, and then uh, we helped them again um, about May, those that were doing seamless summer, we just didn't have time to train them in the summer food service program right there in March and April. But by the, end, by the middle of April, really, we felt like we could provide that training. So anyone that wanted to transition to the summer food service program to have that increased reimbursement and the easier meal pattern, we did help do that. Um, so our totals for this current school year, we only have 21 sponsors implementing just the National School Lunch Program. Most of those are private um, schools. We have 67 with the Seamless Summer and 342 Summer Food Service Program sponsors. Our CACFP sponsors have remained pretty steady, which we are so thankful for. Some closed due to quarantines or um, problems with illness for short periods, but most of those are back and operating. Please also notice that in those 342 sponsors in SFSP and 67 in SSO, we have over 1,310 approved meal distribution sites or delivery routes. So many, many ways that children are receiving um, nutritious meals in Kansas. 
From a state agency standpoint, we really, really appreciate um, um, USDA providing nationwide waivers, our partners such as Share Our Strength, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the Kansas Association of School Boards, other state agencies, our congressional, dele congressional delegations. It was such a collaborative effort uh, to ensure the continuation of school meals and it took everyone uh, working together to make that happen. Some of the first things we had to do um, we created a waiver application in our claiming and information system. Since grab and go meals were uncharted territory, um, you know, there was a lot to do um, in regard to that and to help our, our sponsors with menu planning, food safety, even traffic control at sites. But one of the big things we initially had to do was try to figure out how we could get sites approved in all areas that needed it because having to have area eligibility eligible sites in the beginning uh, was difficult when everyone, all of our families and children across the state really, really needed the opportunity to get meals. I have so much more I can talk about and Monica only has one minute. So I'll try to weave some of this other um, information into the Q and A's, but Collaboration at all levels uh, was so important. That's another lesson learned. And number three, prioritizing communication, um, making sure we had two-way communication channels. We had daily town halls with our sponsors to begin with. Uh, we needed to hear the questions so we could get those to USDA so that we could then try to meet the needs of Kansas families. Um, let me just close mine with a, a quote we got from, it was an email actually, from a superintendent in a rural district that he sent me in May. He said, thank you so much for all that you have done for our families across the state. Your support has propped our community up more than you will ever know, or we will ever be able to express our appreciation. So I just want to say that um, Kansas school nutrition professionals at the local level, the state agency level, they're resilient, passionate, and caring, and they have continued to persevere with the goal of meeting the nutritional needs of children. So we are here, we are still determined to find ways to provide safe and healthy food so they, those children are fueled and ready to learn. So take it away, Monica. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. I want to um, first, you know, just commend you and all of the school nutrition um, providers across the country who have done just an amazing job of really trying to meet all the needs of um, kids across the country, particularly, of course, all the kids in Kansas, you all have done um, just a great job of, of stepping up and, and, and rising to the challenge. So thank you and look forward to learning more um, through our Q&A. And if you have not yet submitted a Q&A um, and you have um, a question that you want to make sure gets um, answered, please feel free to start submitting them now. Um, we'll start collecting them. So thank you. So we also have with us Emily, who is a um, community partner and provider um, as it relates to meals um, for kids. And so um, Emily is with the Three O'Clock Project. And so we want to make sure that we um, hear from her and from her perspective as a community partner in providing meals through the pandemic. So Emily, um, the floor is all yours. Thanks. Thank you, Monica. I'm super happy to be here. Um, and I'd love to kind of share, you know, who we are and, and what we normally do and then what we've done throughout COVID. Um, so you can head to the next slide. Um, so we are a nonprofit. We're 501c3. We are an approved um, sponsor through the Louisiana Department of Education. Um, we, our mission is to deliver healthy meals and snacks to after school organizations and then various summer camps. Typically, we have about 30 after school partners, um, serve about 3,000 meals a day. And the areas that we serve in a typical year are New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette. 
Um, we, you know, our, our mission, right, when the bell rings at three o'clock um, is to make sure that kids in areas of need do not go home hungry. Um, so I'll kind of launch next slide uh, into what we did when COVID-19 hit. Um, so as we all know, right, schools shut down in March, um, and you can head to the next slide. Um, and our governor, very similar story to Kansas, you know, issued a, a stay at home order. And when that happened here in Louisiana, many public school systems completely shut down. You know, they started with some grab and go meal programs when schools first closed. But when the governor issued that order, a lot of programs just stopped serving food. And it was due to many reasons. Um, but what we saw was immediate, you know, parents who are really struggling. I mean, if you can imagine, you know, parents who whose children depend on school for breakfast and lunch and sometimes supper to suddenly have all of your kids home and, you know, not have budgeted to feed them breakfast and lunch. Um, it was a real panic moment. Um, so, you know, what what our role in that was immediately trying to figure out how can we help? You know, what can our organization do as a, you know, third party nonprofit um, sponsor? Um, a lot of public school systems that had to shut down, you know, they, they were part of unions or they have school boards. And as a smaller organization, we really had the flexibility to kind of just go. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so, you know, we thought, number one, what was the you know, immediate need? Um, Short-term goal was get food into our community ASAP. You know, every minute and hour that passed, we really kind of felt this pressure of that's another you know, family that's in need and that, that would benefit from meals that they're not getting. So we really quickly gathered a team. Um, we brought together a bunch of actual restaurant owners and food truck owners who had experience with, you know, kind of a more massive food distribution system. And I don't know if you could say luckily about Louisiana, but we're very used to large natural disasters. So a lot of the folks I gathered had done, you know, feeding during Hurricane Katrina or during some of our floods. So we, we really had the space um, to kind of tackle this and tackle this quickly. So the next slide um, kind of goes through what our thought process was. Um, like I said, where you know our immediate was let's get food out into the community, find the partners, feed kids long term. How can we do this? You know, financially, um, how can we? Clearly, it was a you know going to be a prolonged issue leading into summer. Schools weren't going to open back up, um, so we long term planned and you know, the, the number five kind of ask for forgiveness later when in crisis mode, I'll have to hand it to our state agency. They saw the immediate, you know, crisis of no one is in certain areas is feeding. So they came to us, we kind of came to them and said, we can provide a solution and let's just figure it out as we all go. So they really were helpful in opening doors for us and removing barriers and saying, just get out there, have distribution, do your, you know, do bus routes, do all these things that we've never really done before, and we'll work it out on the back end. Um, so that was really, you know, welcoming to have the support of not only our state agency, but so many different partners and community organizations. And we kind of launched into rural areas. You know, as I said before, we were focused in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, which most people, when you think of Louisiana, you know about those cities. Um, so we were now going into areas where nothing was happening. And the state was approaching us saying, you know, this parish, uh, which is a county in all other states, you know, aren't, um, they, they don't have anything. Can you go? Can your team show up and distribute meals? And what we were doing was distributing um, five to seven meals or five to seven days worth of meals in one box um, with fresh milk and produce. Um, so the next slide kind of goes through this idea of, you know, that old saying, it takes a village. Well, this 
I promise you, you know, we did not work alone. Um, we partnered with Boys and Girls Clubs, YMCA's, food banks, um, United Way, the governor stepped in and gave us a grant. We raised half a million dollars um, to really get this off the ground. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, the results are that we served over 5.5 million meals between March when schools shut down and all the way to the end of August when schools started back up. And we employed over 400 people. We partnered with 12 public school districts across Louisiana. We worked with local restaurants, several local produce, dairy companies. We had about $15 million in federal funds right from all of our claims pumped back into our economy. Um, to, in, in, to, to launch this effort. Um, and you can go to the next slide too. Um, and so to wrap up, right, it, it, it was um, quite the feat and we used every partner and resource and person we knew. And the, you know, I, someone mentioned silver linings. The silver linings of this was that so many people wanted to help and said, what do you need? How can we support you? Is it money? Is it people? Is it trucks? Is it equipment? So I think that all of our communities see this need and that's encouraging because it no longer feels like a burden on you know, our small organization. Our communities really all took it on and said, we all need to work together to solve this problem of food insecurity. So I'm kind of you know, excited to, to be here and chat with the rest of this amazing panel and, and kind of share out some things that we, we learned. Thanks everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to be with us and really appreciated all of the panelists providing their unique perspective to helping to feed kids. Um, I'm gonna open this up and um, ask a couple of questions of each of our panelists um, and to help elaborate and expand on some of the points that they made. Um, so first I'm gonna ask Stacy Dean um, cause a lot of these questions have also come up in the chat. Um, so I think um, now is probably a good time to like pose this question. You know, we have really seen how these flexibilities through USDA have been just incredible in kind of removing the barriers and the challenges for both um, the providers as well as families and children. And so I think, you know, in light of what you have seen and, you know, in terms of how um, USDA has responded and continues to respond, um, curious if you could elaborate and share with us, you know, as schools begin to reopen and to attempt to do that safely and understanding that the need for flexibility is going to continue and the need for these programs is going to continue as well. Um, we're not going to immediately wake up one day and be back on our feet where we were pre-pandemic. So curious about what you're thinking with respect to what will be available for community partners and providers going forward and how USDA plans to continue to respond to this pandemic. Sure. So let me so let me say I'm not going to I don't have an announcement to make today, but I'll just tell you briefly how we're thinking about it. One lesson learned from last year and Cheryl can um, respond with it is one of the things that we heard loud and clear was dripping out the waivers and waiting, waiting uh, to provide information about what would be coming was highly problematic. So one of the things we're trying to do is come together with comprehensive guidance for the school year uh, as soon as possible. And the secretary has charged me with doing that by April so that everybody can see the full landscape of what the flexibility will be. So we are, so that can also make it a little frustrating because we it'll take a little bit longer. We are talking very closely with the Department of Education because successful school reopening is fundamental to the like to everything that we're doing. And we wanna make sure that the school meals program has the flexibility they need to support reopening for everyone to be safe, kids, the school food workers, uh, teachers. And um, 
And we also really appreciate these programs traditionally, even in our, in our normal great perfect year operate on an incredibly tight margin and so right not not being in a highly unpredictable circumstance can and also because of public health concerns can increase costs so that's something that's on my mind as well so we uh, and and i also agree that everything isn't going to be okay in september so we're just like i said those are the things that are factoring in um I, I, i'll also say that um, trying to do our best with respect to robust nutrition standards is important and making sure that whatever we do next year gets us back on our feet for the program uh, and whatever regular operations is uh, for 2022-23. So that's our thinking and I welcome feedback on that and we hope um, to have a big package out very soon. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so Cheryl, I have a question for you. Um, so, you know, I think you have done an amazing job of trying to reach um, all the kids in Kansas and wondering if you could share with us, you know, the role of the flexibilities in helping you to do that and think innovatively how you meet the needs of children. You know, we're, we're gonna be moving into child nutrition reauthorization. Um, there's a hearing this week on that. And so it would be really great to hear your perspective about how some of these flexibilities um, helped you and how you think maybe they could be integrated into child nutrition reauthorization. Thank you, yes. Uh, the flexibilities have just been um, so important to meet the needs of our, um, not just rural children, but the children also in our urban settings this year with COVID. But um, some examples might be uh, out in Western Kansas, we had a lot of meat packing plants. And with that, those were some of our first COVID hotspots. And a lot of the families that had folks working in the meat packing plants also had folks working in school food service. Um, the flexibilities would allow the sponsors, we could have them get in contact with each other and say Dodge City could maybe provide meals to a small community community. They wouldn't have been able to do that, um, you know, to prepare the meals, get them all in bulk, get those to the small communities then to get out if we hadn't had those waivers. Um, also, you know, we have stories in Dodge City where um, I have this picture of the mother that walked with her two children to the site a mile each way every day, no matter what the rain, um, the snow, it didn't matter. They were there. Um, so, you know, the ability to have sites and expand sites into the areas that weren't area eligible, that was another waiver that was extremely important. So we could cut down maybe on some of the people having to walk so far or having to go so far to the meal sites. Also uh, having the waivers for meal times, that was so important, you know, that you could then do the bulk meals for a whole week um, and we could have them come to a meal site one time uh, for the week to have meals for seven days for their fan, for their children. Um, all of those played a critical role in us being able to meet the needs of Kansas children. Those are my top three, I would say, meal times, area eligibility, and non-congregate. Great. Thank you for that insight. Um, you know, Emily, I think, you know, you really talked about how really the after school program CACFP has played a critical role for children um, prior to the pandemic and then having to turn on a dime to figure out how to meet the need um, you know with the pandemic and I'm wondering if you could um, paint a picture for us of the child nutrition landscape um, in rural Louisiana um, as it pertains to your response during COVID. Um, we know that these are tend to be underserved communities and, and you know, schools not always being an active partner in that area. Um, and, you know, just the overall issue of equity. And I'm wondering if you could expand on that a little bit more. Sure. So, you know, from my experience, it's schools either don't offer any meals over the summer months, you know, they kind of close their doors when school ends in May and they open back up in August, or 
they'll offer meals, but only through, you know, their small summer camp or, um, you know, extended learning that they do for specific kids. And they're not necessarily an open site. Um, I, I think that's definitely the case in many areas and many school districts here. And, you know, outside of schools, right, if they're not serving, you're going to find a lot of religious organizations that might offer some small summer meal camp. Um, and beyond that, you know, we're really starting to dig into this more, you know, COVID has kind of highlighted the fact that there aren't a lot of summer meal operators, especially with school systems, you know, when COVID hit and all these schools closed and a lot of them were, you know, well, normally we don't serve meals in summer. So see you in the fall. I think that was a big problem with a pandemic um, and it got really highlighted. So, you know, hopefully um, a lot of these inequities around access and rural areas can start to be addressed now that we see how crucial schools, you know, really can or really are with feeding kids. Right. Thank you. You, you know, one thing, um, you know, one thing that I think, you know, the secretary mentioned this morning was, you know, being bold and innovative and, you know, thinking about how they really want to, you know, improve the WIC program, strengthen that program so it could better meet the needs of, of infants and pregnant women and families. And I'm thinking about the summer meals program where even prior to the pandemic, it was only reaching 18% of eligible children. And, you know, as you know, for Share Strength, that is really a big priority for us through child nutrition reauthorization. And I think what we've seen through a lot of these flexibilities and opportunities, and you know, even to streamline some of the administrative, um, you know, challenges and duplication between CACFP and summer meals. Um, you know, I think it's kind of hard to put the as they say, to put the horse back in the barn now that children have, you know, had the opportunity to access meals without having to sit on a bus um, to, to meet the congregate requirement. Can you share with us, um, you know, what is your vision? Like, what would you like to see as we go forward to think about, you know, things that, the changes that you experience and what you hope could be um, permanent going forward? Well, I'll jump in with one. I think I think some it, sometimes in this moment, I mean, it's a crazy moment, um, but we tend to think about little individual. We think about individual pieces. They're not little. They're important. But it is. I think we should step back a little bit and think about the whole. So, you know, one of the things I'm not hearing that much from folks who are in the child nutrition space, but I would really encourage you to step back and think about because this may be the single boldest thing that at least I work on. And that is that we've been asked to revise, reevaluate the thrifty food plan in SNAP, to, uh, which is the basis for the benefit to uh, ensure that it is sufficient, a sufficient benefit level aligned with the dietary guidelines and modern shopping practices to, to adjust that. That So the thrifty food plan, I think, is universe, SNAP benefits are universally understand as being too small to afford a basic healthy diet. But just, to, and you know, my science folks are off doing what they're gonna do, but just imagine, step back, what if SNAP were sufficient for a healthy diet, right? That actually cascades through and changes quite a lot because we are operating in an extremely scarcity oriented environment, um, uh, running around trying to grab the, 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 bit, the, the small resources that we can for families in need. But what if through that program, they had enough money to feed their families? So that's one thing. And the second is we are potentially looking at sort of a, a, not, a very robust summer feeding program that goes directly to households this summer and next summer. So here again, um, what does that mean for all of the other programs? It doesn't mean that we don't need summer feeding. Of course we do. And summer feeding complements, you know, terrific activities and programming. Uh, but I, I feel like we need to step back a little bit and think about how the pieces fit together. To me, the, both of those are extraordinarily bold. And um, uh, it means that maybe we can 
think less from a scarcity perspective and start more about how do we build these programs to harmonize perspective, to support families where they're at. Cheryl, yes. Monica, I have um, one thing that I always think about, you know, we have to have the 50% free and reduced price eligible sites in the summer. And, you know, we have um, communities, schools in Kansas that are 46% free and reduced. So you can't qualify a site there. Um, maybe by census, you can find a little small track, but it may not be where you want to have a meal site. It's not in a safe location or where kids gather. You know, if you have, 46% free and reduced, there is need in that community. Um, if you mean, if you see what I'm saying, it's like, um, I'm not sure where, why that is there. If I was thinking bold, I wish that you could make these meals available to all children because there are times that families are experiencing hardship, you know, um, that we don't know um, what is going on that may have happened after they completed their free and reduced application, um, like COVID, you know, it hit. And really there were many families in our communities who appreciated the meals. So my bold thought is, you know, why do we have to have the 50% free and reduced to be able to have a summer site there? Monica, you're on mute. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, I would um, like to turn it over to Emily and see what your perspectives are. Oh, so many bold moves. I could list like 10, but um, I think one that I've seen is this non-congregate waiver. You know, in the past, in order to get a meal, a child had to be physically present in that eligible program. And what we've seen were so many families coming to pick up meals and bring them to other families and friends. And even if they didn't have kids and they would come and say, look, we know I have these, you know, five houses in my neighborhood and they have young kids and I offered to come and pick the, this food up. It was a wonderful thing. And I think that knowing that childhood um, food insecurity is, goes so high in the summer, that one way to alleviate that would be to allow areas that are higher needs. So right, if we're gonna stick to this 50% or more free and reduce, maybe those areas can offer non-congregate meals in addition to the in-person kids to, to help you know, make sure we're catching all kids. Because if you really think about it, the kids probably most in need aren't being brought to a daily summer program by mom and dad. They're probably at home alone, you know, figuring things out. So I would love to see that. Um, I'd also love to see school, school districts. You know, I know in Texas, there's a state mandate that if you are free 50% more, 50% or more free and reduced, you have to offer a summer program. You don't have the option to just close your doors over the summer. I'd love to see that become a bigger thing, but in that knowing that a lot of schools who don't, it's a financial problem, it's a staffing problem. So let's support schools more and have them be a bigger voice in summer and for after school meals. So those would be my two big to do's. Thank you, Emily. Um, I want to turn to some of the questions. We've gotten quite a few questions from um, some of the folks listening in. Um, so I, I think that, you know, one of the interesting questions that I saw earlier was the fact that um, in rural communities, the school um, cafeteria is the biggest, um, is the biggest um, way in which people can prepare food and deliver it and is there a way that it could be more available um, for other feeding programs um, to help feed the elderly and other folks in the community and so Cheryl I'm just wondering and Stacy if you all want to chime in on that well in Kansas we have had some partnerships um, with schools and um, Meals on Wheels uh, we've also had some inquiries lately about this very thing. Um, so that is something we are looking at. And I'd be interested for um, Stacy to weigh on in as well um, 
I do think it would require, uh, it requires careful planning, of course, for integrity between the programs, but I do think it is possible when done correctly. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm sure if I'm going to say something wrong, my team who's lurking in, <laughs> on, in the attendees will tell me, but the schools own their kitchen. So uh, I think uh, I don't see us as being, as long as it's not, you know, as long as the school, the food for school and the staff and the billing and all of that is separated. I thought it was a great idea. Actually, I went back to Karen in the chat and said, tell me more. What do you mean? I think, uh, I think this is a good conversation to, uh, to get going. Yeah, definitely. Um, Emily, any thoughts, ideas, given the partners that you've been working with? I, I think that's a wonderful idea. And I think like Stacy said, nobody's saying no, right? Like, let's do it. Um, but I think that, that, right, it's way easier said than done, but that could, that could be a really neat pilot, you know, with a school district that wants to be innovative, creative, maybe has funds there to, to support the whole family. You know, a lot of our community partners, um, right? We can only feed kids 18 and under. We got asked so many times, but what about, you know, grandma that lives in the house? Like, how, can, you, can she have a meal and can they have a meal? And, you know, our hearts kind of broke, but in the moment we had to say no, but maybe there's another organization that can step in. So I think that that's a really great idea and that there's, there's room for it. And, you know, and the comments, New York did that over the summer, the DOE in New York said anybody who wants a meal, young, old, anyone can get one. So maybe that's a cool, you know, case study to see how did they do it? How did they fund that? What partnerships did they use? That's great. You know, um, equity has been at the forefront for many of us, in particular for USDA, um, as Secretary Vilsack has taken the helm in terms of thinking about how we, you know, address the inequities. And I know, Cheryl, in talking with you, you had mentioned um, the public charge rule and, and meeting the needs of the immigrant families near the meat packing areas. And I know, Emily, you referenced um, the NAACP lawsuit um, in Louisiana in terms of um, kids being able to um, actually, in practical terms, access meal sites. And, um, you know, Stacey, I know you're thinking a lot about um, how we think about and applying equity to the policies at USDA. I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit on that. Um, and, you know, Cheryl, I'll start with you um, since you kind of um, shared with us um, your experience of meeting the needs of, of immigrant children. Um, we think in Kansas that we would have more areas that would be eligible for community eligibility if families would complete um, applications for food assistance, but they don't because um, they're worried about doing so. Um, so in those areas, sometimes those families don't even feel comfortable filling out a free and reduced price application. And this is what Monica and I were visiting a little bit about. Um, so that is a challenge. Um, we would have more schools that could implement community eligibility, we feel, um, but, but we just don't have the numbers um, that are receiving food assistance. So that was what we talked about. And I'd be interested to hear about other folks if they're having similar issues that they see. Great. Emily, you wanna share with us a little bit more? I guess maybe can you reframe like a more specific a little question? Yeah, I think, you know, as we're all thinking about equity and how we best meet the needs of kids across the country um, who are underserved and um, you had shared with us the article about um, the NAACP and the work that they've done in Louisiana. I'm wondering if you could share with us how you think about equity and and as that continues to be um, at the forefront, how you're thinking about your work through an equity lens. So something I say all the time, and I'm, I'm sure every person, you know, listening in and on this call would too, is that every child deserves access to healthy food, right? No matter their situation, their background, their parents, etc. 
Um, so one thing that our nonprofit has really kind of tried to put ahead of that is how do we best reach the kids who don't have, you know, an advocate for themselves? Like, how can we now be their advocate? And something we saw in, in Louisiana when COVID-19 hit was so much an equity around rural areas or low poverty areas without good transportation and access. And that got highlighted um, and almost, you know, a lawsuit brought because parents specifically, you know, of um, minority, uh, you know, high um, concentrations of poverty, um, black families did not have access to healthy meals where the closest one was four miles away and they don't have access to transportation. So something we've kind of thought about is as we're planning for this summer are doing more um, routes or home deliveries. You know, we're launching a big home delivery program in partnership with the school district um, this summer to say, we're gonna deliver a box of seven days of meals directly to the home of individuals that sign up with delivery windows and, you know, we're gonna use technology and all these things to really try and address this because I, I just don't feel like, you know, just because you don't have access to a car um, means you shouldn't have access to healthy food. So that's gonna be our kind of goal this summer is to really target the rural and the places that don't have good transportation. Great. Stacy, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think th these are great examples of um, just stopping and pausing for a minute and saying, hey, is there a disparity here that we can address? I, I, you know, we're doing that across all of our programs, but we also need to do it with the partners, the people we're listening to and talking to, right? Who's informing um, our perspective and we need to do the internal work in our own organization to make sure that we are building a, a diverse inclusive work uh, place so that multiple perspectives are coming to the fore as we're making policy. So we're we're starting those efforts across across the board. And I will say, I mean, I can just reassure you that all the things that you're hearing and seeing, you know, from the president and on the White House website, it is not, it, it is all very real. We are being asked um, also to uh, understand, to demonstrate where are their gap, what are we doing about it, and where are the results that show that we've made a difference. And a good example would be WIC. We know that maternal and child health uh, uh, disparities sorry, there are extraordinary disparities across race and ethnic groups within the arena of maternal and child health outcomes, where um, African-American uh, uh, mothers and uh, basic development amongst infants and toddlers really fall behind their white counterparts. WIC is a proven intervention to um, some, providing some remedy for that problem. So because we have a real sense that it works, we're going to lean in on making sure that that program is uh, available and connected to uh, communities that would benefit from it. So, um, you know, that's just, uh, it, there's a lot of work to do there. And part of it is building our own muscle to be able to take on the work, so. That'd be great. I wanna end on one question that um, somebody asked, and um, I think it's a kind of a forward looking question, um, but you know, as we reflect on last summer and all that we have been through, what are the top three, three, three things um, you are doing this summer and going forward are the lessons that you have learned, especially from last um, summer's operations? Um, so basically, what are the top three things that you've learned and are going to apply going forward? I'll start with you, Emily. Oh, rats. Um... <laughs> I think that, I don't know if I can come up with three, however, I'll say a few, um, especially with this conference topic, right, working with rural areas, it's that you really have to have um, partnerships more than coming in and saying, we're going to do this, right, and, and kind of be an outsider. So for, for me, it's a thing that I've learned is to really create some allies and get more people who aren't in your industry involved and invested. So we've now worked with our, you know, with 
um, our economic development uh, arm in Baton Rouge and um, other, other funders who've never really looked at child you know, food before are now interested with Blue Cross Blue Shield is interested. Um, you know, we've, we work with local sheriffs and local pastors and may, the sheriffs in Louisiana are so involved. Um, I have made many a friend of these, you know, sheriffs of these local towns that really care and they, you know, want the best. So I'd say a big lesson learned is don't do this alone, get your whole community involved and you'll find that there's way more support and collaboration out there through you know even we've worked with restaurants and and just anyone and everyone get them involved and that's our tactic this coming summer is to make this problem of child food insecurity everyone's problem it's not just our problem on this call, right? It should be the whole town's problem. And um, that's where we've seen the most success. Thanks, Emily. Cheryl, you want to? Yes, um, I think that we will continue to work with collaboration, collaborative partnerships, just like Emily has talked about. We saw with school districts um, being able to have more purchasing power, um, more manpower in communities that some of our volunteer organizations and our private nonprofits um, churches, they ended up helping schools last summer. You know, they formed partnerships to help. And I do hope that that will happen again this summer. We also, um, I feel that we want this pandemic to be a catalyst to improve, just like Stacy was talking about being bold and you know what is best to go forward. Um, it has opened the door to a lot of conversations with superintendents in our state about that, hey, we really could be providing summer meals. We found a lot of administrators who didn't realize that. Um, they've been providing breakfast we want them to continue to have innovative breakfast models going forward. Um, we know that our school food service folks are tired. They have been working many, many hours, but we hope they will continue into the summer. And, you know, with partnerships and with staffing, we, we you know, we're here to support them in any way we can. And then moving on to what we're going to find out about in April, which we are anxiously awaiting to see what the next school year is going to bring. But, um, and communication, we have got to continue this two-way communication with our sponsors. So we're hearing their thoughts, responding, being transparent. Um, I think we're gonna continue our weekly town halls or more often if needed into the school year um, so that we can better respond to meet the needs of Kansas kids. Stacey, would love to hear from your perspective, <laughs> even yeah. though you were not around for last summer in your current capacity. Well, but. I know, and I don't just have three, though, so those are all great. Um, I would definitely say connection and partnership and engagement. We need to be doing more of that, and, and uh, in the chat, Brooke listed um, how to sign up for our, um, our emails, and we need to build our lists, uh, but not just so you can hear from us, but more fundamentally, we need to hear from you. Um, I would definitely say, I heard it loud and clear, Cheryl, from you and others, we need to get guidance out early, right? Schools are planning now uh, for the fall and they, 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 uh, they cannot be successful and plan and do all of the amazing things that they do if they don't know what the rules of the road are. So absolutely hear that. And I guess I just wanna loop back to this summer as I think about something that's really important is um, all of us doing work to do outreach to immigrant communities who um, for policies and actions from the prior administration are justifiably scared and concerned um, for their immigration status and their family safety if they engage with, uh, with uh, federal nutrition programs. And that under this administration is no longer the case. And so we have a lot of work to do to inform, but also just fundamentally restore trust. Um, uh, I think trust is broken with a lot of, between many immigrant communities and um, some core federal agencies, and we need to own that and work, work on it. So this summer I, I commit to doing that. 
and now I'm not waiting, but just wanted to let you know. That's fantastic. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, all of you have really kind of, you know, one, one critical theme that has kind of, and I, I just kind of want to share, I think some of the things that we've heard loud and clear and what I've seen in the chat box as well is that, you know, the need to continue with the flexibilities to allow for non-congregate options, something that is just critical in feeding kids, um, you know, all across the country. Um, and so I think, you know, that is certainly a running theme. I think the other things that um, all of you have touched upon that I think are really critical, um, you know, and I think that is true for this pandemic is um, the role of partnerships and collaboration. And I know that's been true for us at Share Our Strength that, you know, we've really kind of um, relied on our partners to help us be, um, you know, eyes and ears on the ground to help us to understand what was needed, um, how we best advocated um, for key flexibilities and policies to make sure that you could continue to do that heavy lift of feeding kids. And then I think, of course, you know, working closely with USDA to, you know, continue to communicate all of the challenges and, and what everybody needs to be able to meet all those challenges. I'm going to turn it to each of you for just a quick um, closing remark, and then um, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up. Um, so, um, Stacy, if you want to go ahead and start, that would be great. Well, I think really um, the two things. One is just to go back to uh, what you all, I think, really have known for a long time, which is how fragile so many families are, right? You see it every day. You see why they're coming to the programs or why they can't make it to the programs. I thought Emily's example of we're probably not seeing the families and the kids that are most in need was really powerful. That's now um, more on the, more on the um, I guess it's there's a greater awareness of that, given the, how many families fell into hunger and uh, and just deep economic distress. And so we need to use this moment to keep lifting up and championing that situation and that the solutions are both shoring up federal food assistance, but also addressing the systemic, um, the systemic problems and failures that lead to families being in those circumstances. Um, so uh, I think that that's one is we've just, we cannot let go of this silence. Uh, silence will be, uh, a, a deep concern for me. If, if as things get better, we, we think we can leave behind the deep um, difficulty that so many families have. And second is I really just need to say briefly, I say it a lot, but I really don't think I can say it enough, express my deep, deep gratitude for everything that the, all of the Emily's and Cheryl's have done over the past year. Um, I sometimes get choked up when I do this, but I can't even begin to imagine what you all did and um, to ensure that children eat. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl. You're on mute. I do that all the time on our town halls too, <laughs> thank you. Um, I wanna tie back a little bit to the speaker right before our panel. Um, I had this written in my notes and I hadn't had a chance to talk about it yet, but even with all the challenges that we had this year, which in Kansas, we call those opportunities to serve. We had a lot of good opportunities, all those silver linings that came out of this. And one of them was the connectivity that our sponsors had with the students who felt that care and that love of those serving the meals. Um, it really, I saw, um, I just saw some amazing things. I could be like you, I could tear up too. Um, but some families did trips to meal pickup just so they could have that connection with school people for something normal. Um, so important. And it's really increased our team. I feel like we're working better together. I feel that we even have a stronger collaboration with our sponsors who those are our schools and, you know, any people that sponsor child nutrition programs in our states. And then also, I couldn't have made it through this year without the other state agencies. 
I mean, we were working together, we were sharing, we were trying to not reinvent the wheel and talking to each other. Sometimes with, we didn't have guidance yet, but we knew we had to feed kids. So we try to figure out what we should do. And we tried to do it together and we were right. I mean, we didn't have to go back really. We kind of knew what was coming, even though USDA has to go through all the legal things. But I really appreciated all of those folks and USDA, who they were trying very hard to get everything out to us, but they have to go through so many hoops. And sometimes I don't think they, people understand that. They want to, but they can't. Just like sometimes I want to do things. Like I'd like to say, sure, every kitchen could collaborate in communities and do this. But, you know, there's food safety things we have to think about and capacity of staff. And so I just want to say that, um, you know, it has been really, really um, just awesome to me to see all of this happening, this caring, concern and love um, through food, through school meals, um, through CACFP meals our important safety net for right. our children. Cheryl, thank you. And I'm not going to lie, every now and then when I saw those non-congregate waivers come through, I'd sit at my computer and cry and <laughs> just thinking, oh my gosh, we did this again. So um, I, I feel both um, Stacy and Cheryl on that front. Emily, you get the last two minutes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so I think that through all of this, that it, a spotlight has been put on the importance of nutrition in schools and these USDA programs. You know, so often I'm used to it not being a priority and superintendents having a million other things on their plate. And I get that and testing and reporting and school food is often not thought about as first. And I think that COVID-19 has exposed what really matters, right? When schools shut down, it wasn't make sure they get educated. It wasn't make sure you submit all these testing. It was feed them. So for me, I hope that this continues to ripple through the U.S. and we continue to see how important school meals are for our children. Um, and, and two, I'd say we need a lot more disruptors. You know, I've been called that and I think um, I'm okay with it. I'm sure, you know, I've, I've caused a few headaches for some people, but I think that we, now is time for change. Like let's continue to build on what USDA has done, what our state agencies are doing and show that change is good. And it is time to, to rethink school food and summer meals and after school meal programs. Um, and lastly, I would love to have like a support group, right, for what we've all been through. I feel like we need to go to meetings or, or have some Zoom calls because prior to this, I've often felt like I worked in a silo and, you know, the folks around me, they've, they've got different concerns and priorities. But for me, it's always been, you know, child, child food and feeding. And I think this has kind of shown that a lot more people care than we think about. Um, and, and I'm not alone, right? There's an army of us that really want to make sure these kids get fed. And so if somebody wants to start a support group, I'll sign up and I'll come talk every week. Well, thank you. Thank you, Emily. And, you know, I might join you in that support group. And, um, you know, I want to thank all of you for being such great strategic agitators and, you know, getting us to think um, outside of the box and, and feeding the kids across the country. So thank you for that. Um, so, you know, this brings us to the conclusion of this panel and wanna thank everyone for joining us here today. We'd like you to stay tuned as we enjoy a video um, that is being brought to us um, by Cornell University Cooperative um, Extension um, in partnership with um, our Cooking Matters program. So again, um, thanks to all of you and hope this will not be our last conversation. Talk to you soon and thank you everyone.